morning. It is always great to be here uh, preaching to you guys this morning, uh, sharing the Word of God with you all. It's always a delight for me. I'm really excited to be up here with all of you this morning. Today we're going to be taking a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to be starting in verse 16 and going down through 21. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 16, going down to verse 21. And as you guys turn there in your Bibles, I kind of wanted to start us off today with a question. Who do you represent? Who are you representing? Or maybe what are you representing in your life? We all represent something in little ways and big ways. and In littler ways, I don't know, maybe you have a favorite sports team and you wear the shirt with the sports team logo on it or a ball cap with your favorite sports team. You, maybe you're a, you support the U of A Wildcats and so you've got the U of A t-shirt going on. Or like me, you support the Cubs and you have your Cubs hat that you wear all over the place. Fair, that's fair. I see there's some love and some hate out there for that. But we also represent people in big ways uh, as a part of our job. We represent our employer. We represent our company. When we interact with people through our job, we are representing our employer over the cash register, over the emails that we send, through the phone calls that we make. Right now, I'm representing El Camino to all of you. We also represent our family. How many of you guys have heard the phrase, I know your mama didn't raise you to be X, Y, or Z? I'm up here representing the Klingenberg clan this morning. But one of the ways I've really seen representation in like us representing people is when we go overseas, we represent our country. You see, I grew up in Germany, and our family was one of the few American families that our German friends and neighbors knew. And so we, in a lot of ways, represented America to them. I remember every year we would try to make a point of inviting some of our German friends and neighbors over for Thanksgiving. And we would put out the whole spread for them, and my mom would make apple pie. And I remember most of our German friends and family had never had apple pie before. It's a distinctly American thing, an American tradition. And they would eat it for the first time, and they all loved apple pie. They loved Thanksgiving. It was really fun sharing those traditions and that piece of our American culture with our German friends and family. Well, I guess newfound family. <laughs> we all represent something, and we all represent the things that we love and care about, bits of our culture, those things that are important to us, those come out. I wear my Cubs hat because I love the Cubs. We represented America to our German friends because we love America. And so today, as we take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 through 21, we're going to see Paul make the case that God is calling us to be representatives of him in our everyday lives. We are called to be Jesus' representatives in the world around us. And we're going to take a look at three distinct ways that God calls us to be representatives. Three things that we need to be good representatives for him. Read with me, if you will, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. From now on, then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through, God, through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So as we look at this passage, we see Paul outlining this ministry of reconciliation and calling us to be ambassadors. So how do we be ambassadors? How can we be good representatives, good ambassadors for Christ? Well, I think the first thing that we need to be good ambassadors of Christ is we need to take on Christ's perspective. 
we to take on Christ's perspective. In verse 16, Paul says, From now on, then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective, even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective. Yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Paul is calling on us to abandon our old perspective, the old way we used to look at the people around us. Our world uses all sorts of, our culture uses all sorts of metrics by which to judge people and which to put them into, into boxes, right? By which to say, is this person somebody worth paying attention to or is this person somebody that maybe I can write off? Our culture has a lot of these metrics. It can be how successful a person is. Hey, is this person successful or are they maybe not successful? Does this person have money or are they poor? Where is this person from? Who do they hang out with? What kind of groups are they a part of? We evaluate people based on all these different things that are important to the world, and we kind of make a judgment on people. If you want evidence that that's the case, just look at celebrities in America, right? Our celebrity culture. We look at these people, they're successful, they're good looking, they have lots of money, they hang out with the right people, they believe the right things, they say the right things. These are people worth holding up as the pinnacle of acting, music, sports, science, and technology. Those are the people we're looking at. And Paul is saying, hey, let us not, let's set aside that worldly perspective. Let's, let's not look at people through the eyes of the world, through the, the criteria that our culture has set out. Let's look at the people the way God has us looking at people. In fact, he goes so far as to say a lot of us used to know used to look at Jesus through this worldly perspective. And if you look at Jesus through the worldly perspective, he doesn't stack up very well, does he? He was born in a kind of a nowhere part of Israel, the backwoods of Israel. He was born to poor parents. He hung out with sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes. His message wasn't very well accepted. In fact, in terms of success, they said, no, we don't want you, and they crucified him. When stacked up against the criteria of the world, the worldly perspective Jesus is kind of a loser. But we don't know Jesus through a worldly perspective anymore. We know him through a heavenly perspective, and we see him as the Messiah and God that he truly is, the person who bought us our freedom and made us right into right relationship with God. And so Paul calls on us to abandon our old perspective and take up a new perspective. In verses 18, he says, or sorry, in verse 17, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. This idea of new life, it echoes all throughout 2 Corinthians, and especially 2 Corinthians 5. In fact, just a little bit earlier in 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 15, Paul says this, and he died for all, he being Jesus, he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Jesus died, and we died with him. Our old selves died, and we are raised to new life in Christ. We have a new life. We have a new relationship with God. We have a new heart. We are free from our old way of life and from sin and from those things that pull us down, and we get to have newness with Christ. And as a part of that new life, we get to have a new perspective, a new perspective on the people and the world around us. And so how do we look at people? How do we see people? Do we see people the way the world sees people, or do we look at people the way God looks at them? In a lot of ways, this idea of perspective shift reminded me of when I started working at a coffee house. I know it sounds strange, but bear with me on this. When I first started here at El Camino, I started working at a coffee house part-time. And prior to working at the coffee house, I had a pretty one-dimensional view of coffee. Give it to me strong, with a little bit of cream. As long as it's got caffeine and it'll get me through the day, that's the kind of coffee I want. I wasn't very picky. You get it to me from a gas station, from Dunkin' Donuts, from McDonald's from Starbucks, wherever you get it, as long as it's got the caffeine to keep me going through the day, I'm there. But after starting at the coffee house, my employer said, hey, this isn't, you, you can't look at coffee this way anymore, bud. 
you've got to take a more nuanced view of the coffee that you're selling to our customers. And they poured out various cups of coffee, and they say, hey, do you taste the difference here? Do you taste the difference between this coffee that was grown and harvested in South America versus this coffee that was grown and harvested in Indonesia? Do you see how the different brewing methods we use change the flavor and taste of this coffee? Do you see how some coffees pair well with this and some other coffees pair well with that? And after the first couple of weeks at this coffee house, my perspective on coffee was totally different. Because that's, I needed to shift my perspective in order to work at the coffee house. And so if we're going to work as representatives for Jesus, if we have been raised to new life to serve Christ, we need to shift our perspective on the people that we see around us. You see, Jesus sees people in one of two ways. Either they're alive with him, brothers and sisters in Christ, or they're dead in their sin, and they're in need of the hope of the gospel. When we look out at the world around us, do we see that? Do we see all of those people who are in need of the hope? And does that realization burden us? I think it's easy to get caught up and distracted by all those worldly things I was talking about. Oh, well, that person's so nice. That person's doing so well. They don't really need Jesus. I know we don't say that directly, but I think sometimes in our brain, that's the subconscious thought pattern we go through. Oh, they're doing so great. For Jesus, there's just alive and there's dead. And do we see that need? Do we see and recognize that crisis? So if we're going to serve Jesus, we need to As his representatives, we need to put on Christ's perspective. But not only that, we also need to take up his heart and his passion for reconciliation. In verses 19 through 20, Paul says, actually, in verses 18 through 19, Paul says this. He says, everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He has committed the message of reconciliation to us. So Paul takes this section to outline the ministry of reconciliation. God's ministry, God's passion, what he is here to do. Jesus' whole purpose here on earth was to reconcile us to God. I love that use of the word reconciliation. It's such a relationship-driven word. What does it mean to reconcile with somebody? It means that your close relationship with somebody has been broken, shattered, fractured for some reason. And you, in the process of reconciliation, reach across that gap, deal with the thing that shattered or fractured your relationship, and not only do you forgive them, you bring them back into relationship with you. It's, it's even beyond forgiveness. Forgiveness is, is taking that thing that has happened, that's transpired between you, and it's saying, hey, I'm not counting that thing you did to hurt me against you anymore. I'm forgiving that. I'm, I'm letting go of that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the relationship is fully restored. Reconciliation is forgiveness, but then it kicks it up a notch, and it says, hey, not only do I forgive you, I am reconciling with you. I am bringing you back into full fellowship and full relationship with me. That closeness that we once had, I'm rebinding it again. Not only does God forgive us of our sins, does he pay the sin, he calls us his children. He makes us his heirs. We have been reconciled to God through the ministry of reconciliation. And if we've been reconciled to God, now God says, hey, Now that you have been reconciled, take on this ministry of reconciliation back with you. If you have received benefit from what I've done, if you have been reconciled, if you have been given new life in me, then you're going to want to tell people about that. This ministry is now your ministry. Twice in these verses, Paul says, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Not only do we experience the ministry of reconciliation, it's passed on to us. Have you ever noticed how the places that we recommend to our friends are the places we've had the best experiences at? If I'm going to recommend a restaurant to somebody, I'm not going to recommend the crappy restaurant. I'm going to recommend the restaurant where they came out and gave me the best food and they had the best service and I ate 
the best steak of my life, right? That's the restaurant I'm going to tell people about. I'm not going to tell, tell anybody about the mechanic that overcharged me and didn't really help fix my car and also wanted to fix a bunch of other things that didn't need done. That's not the mechanic I'm telling my friends about. The mechanic I'm telling my friends about is the guy who treated me fairly, who gave me a good price, and who went above and beyond in their treatment of me. We tell people about the experiences that have been great for us. That's why the biggest proponents of things like Teen Challenge or Alcoholics Anonymous are those people who have come through the program successfully. They say, look at what is done for my life. This is such a good thing. If we have been reconciled to Christ, if we have experienced the goodness of Jesus' love, then naturally we would want to recommend that. It's kind of a funny way of saying it, but we would want to share that with the people around us. We want to tell those, our friends, our family, say, hey, look at what Jesus has done for me. Look at what Jesus has done in my life. Look at how good God has been. And don't you want a little bit of that too? That's what the ministry of reconciliation is all about. And so, if we have been given God's perspective, and we now have God's heart for reconciliation, we're excited about the reconciliation we've received, and we want to pass that on, what then follows? Well, we take that perspective of those hurting people, and we take the excitement we have for reconciliation, and it motivates us to go out and to be messengers on Christ's behalf. And so, if we are going to be Christ's representative, we need to partner in his message and in his ministry. In verses 20 through 21, Paul says this, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God wants us to partner with him in his ministry to the world. God is very clear. He wants the whole world to be reconciled to himself. And he wants us to be a part of that ministry. He wants us to be a part of his plan. God could proclaim his message however he wanted to, right? If he wanted to, he could beam his, himself into your dreams and say, I am God, come follow me. But that's not how he does it. He wants to use us to spread his good news. He wants us to share in the joy of seeing lives transformed. He wants us to be a part of sharing the good news of what Jesus has done in our lives to the people around us. He wants to use us. I love that he says that um, in verse, sorry, in verse 20, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ. Why? Because God is making his appeal through us. And we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He wants to use us to get his message out there. So are we looking for opportunities to talk to people? Are we looking for opportunities to say, hey, here's what God has done in my life and how he's helped me through difficult situations that I've been through, maybe he can help you in yours. Are we looking for opportunities to sprinkle a bit of God's ministry of reconciliation into the lives of our friends? Not only through words, but also in our deeds. One of the cool things about ambassadors is ambassadors are always on. They are always representing their country. They're not just representing their country when they're giving a speech. They're representing their country when they're in their homes, when they're hanging out with their families, when they're walking out into the cities. They are a representative of their country, whether they're giving a speech or not. And one of the best ways that they represent their country is by doing and acting out what their, country, what their country's values and traditions are. Just like we invited friends over for Thanksgiving to share a piece of America with our German friends and neighbors, that wasn't us using words as much as it was inviting people into our homes and showing them what America was like during Thanksgiving time. We can do just as much with our actions and by loving on people than we can with our words. So when you're sitting at the coffee house, having lunch with a friend, when you're picking up your kids, are we looking for opportunities to show love, 
kindness and care to the people around us and to let the love of Christ shine through us. One of the cool things I've noticed is that when people are passionate about something, that passion shines through in everything that they do. For example, I have a friend. Um, I'm, a lot of you know her. Her name's Kristen Wright. Um, and Kristen has a passion, a love for all things Disney. She loves Disney. All you've got to do is spend five minutes in a room with her, and you see that love of Disney come through. You walk into her office, and there's Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse decorations on her walls. She wears Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse themed clothes sometimes, Disney themed clothes. She has Disney themed jewelry. She's been to Disneyland 15 times, I think, so far this year. She loves Disney. And you know what? It's fun talking to her about Disney. I'm not much of a Disney guy, I gotta be honest with you. But when I'm talking to Kristen, I enjoy talking about Disney. Why? Because Kristen loves Disney, and her passion for Disney is exciting to me. It, 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 it's infectious. And the same thing is true of somebody who loves woodworking, and they're talking about their woodworking projects, their carpentry plans. You walk into their house, and they've got evidence of those projects in the form of a workshop or things that are hanging on their wall that they made. Same thing for somebody who's enthusiastic about sports. I guarantee they'll bring up the score of the game to you. In November, when the World Cup happens this year, I'm going to be talking about soccer all day long, representing Germany in the World Cup. Because I love Germany, and I love the World Cup. You're going to hear it through me. What we love, what we're passionate about, shines through in our everyday life. And so if we're passionate about Jesus, if we have received good things from Christ, then that will shine through in our everyday conversation, in our everyday lives through our words, but also through our actions. And I get that it's hard. I get that it's difficult. It's hard and difficult for me. In fact, just the other day, um, somebody I'd been praying for, somebody where I said, hey, Lord, please give me an opportunity to speak into this person's life. The opportunity finally came. I didn't take it because I was afraid. I was afraid of what that person might think. I was afraid of how that person might react. I chickened out, and that's very real. I totally get it. It's difficult, and it can be intimidating. And now I'm praying that God would give me another shot, another chance. But the cool thing is we have a community here. El Camino's mission is connecting hurting people to the hope of the gospel. That's the ministry of reconciliation. That's another way of saying it's the ministry of reconciliation. And so if we're all pursuing that ministry together, it makes things just a little bit easier. I can come and tell my friends, hey, I'm really struggling with getting the courage up to talk to my friend about Jesus. And they say, hey, we get it, it's hard. Let's pray for you, let's encourage you, let's ask you about it. Let's get around you and build a support network so that when the time comes, the next opportunity presents itself, you don't chicken out, you don't bail on the opportunity as it stands. As I close today, I want to ask you guys again, who do you represent? As you go out into the world, as you stand in line at Starbucks, as you pick up your kids, as you meet friends for lunch, as you have dinner with your family, who are you representing? Who are you projecting out into the world? What shines through in your life? Is it Christ? Are we living a life as a representative of Jesus? Are we living on mission for the ministry of reconciliation? Let me pray for us and close us up. Dear Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for this ministry of reconciliation that you have given to us. Thank you so much for the ability that we have to come and be ambassadors for you, to tell everybody that we come across, hey, be reconciled to God. Lord, I pray that you'd give us strength, that you'd give us courage this week. As we go out, as we interact with our friends, our neighbors, our family, Lord, I pray that you would shine your light in and through us and that it would be apparent to anybody who knows us that you are an important and integral part of our lives. Lord, in your name I pray. Amen.